Um, it's a real delight to, uh, to be with you all today. Um, <clears throat> at One, we are, are a global campaigning organization that argues for uh, smart uh, interventions of policy and resources uh, that um, tackle uh, extreme poverty and preventable disease around the world. Uh, and we're delighted to, uh, to have been invited uh, over to IFPRI, uh, headquartered just a few blocks away, uh, to help celebrate and, uh, and think about this, uh, this really terrific uh, second annual report you, you've done, and now I'm going to have to take some water. Sorry. Um, <clears throat> I discover, to, uh, to my, uh, not to my surprise, that many of the comments that I wanted to make uh, have uh, have already been topics um, that uh, both Schengen and Mary uh, focused on, but let me let me just kind of see if I can kind of think of four or five points uh, that struck us in the report as we went through it, and then kind of try and put those into a context of what one does now. As both uh, as both Schengen and Mary uh, uh, indicated in in slightly different ways, uh, everyone recognises that there has been enormous progress, tremendous progress made in African agriculture in the in the last 10 20 years <clears throat> a lot of our work as a campaigning organization is particularly directed uh, towards ensuring that uh, that resources uh, flow to tackling uh, Africa's uh, particular challenges uh, at the same time uh, it's clear I think that um, agricultural productivity in Africa has lagged uh, what we have uh, what we have seen in terms of increases in other parts of the world. Uh, and it seems to me important as an agenda going forward, uh, both in ODA discussions and in other forms of intervention, uh, that we make sure that, uh, that uh, resources flow uh, to those policy changes and sectors uh, that will really lead to significant uh, improvements in African agricultural productivity. And you know the list. Uh, infrastructure, research and development, better use of inputs, uh, education and training, uh, all of these now part of the kind of policy agenda uh, and all of them uh, ones that I suspect uh, we'll hear, hear more about as we proceed towards the G8 in a couple of months' time and then, uh, and then beyond. Uh, I'd add uh, to, uh, to that list, and I've got uh, one of our members of staff with me, and she knows that I kind of add this to every um, uh, list that I make of, uh, of policy changes that we need to think about. Uh, seriously over the next few years, uh, a crying need to address energy poverty, particularly in Africa. Uh, 1.4 billion people without regular access to electricity around the world, 880 million of them in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, and, uh, and providing power uh, to those uh, who don't have it is a way not just of, uh, of making sure that you can do things after 6.30 at night, you can bring, as I call it, life after dark, uh, but that you can also make significant improvements in agricultural productivity, significant improvements in health, uh, and drive down uh, the curve of poverty. Secondly, uh, in addition to, to productivity interventions, uh, I was struck in the, uh, in the report by the, by the clear uh, importance of private sector engagement. And of course, with the new alliance launched last year uh, in the G8, there was sort of a, a new focus uh, in terms of policy, in, uh, in terms of bringing the private sector, the corporate sector, uh, into, uh, into the debate about uh, improving agricultural outputs. Um, and that, too, is, uh, is something that I think will be part of, a key part uh, of the policy agenda going forward uh, as we look to private sector engagement, uh, creating really sustainable value chains uh, for farmers, and in particular small farmers, uh, as we look to private sector engagement, creating real markets uh, that, uh, that connect uh, farmers with, uh, with urban centers, with rapidly growing urban centers and the like. Uh, I was thrilled to see a, uh, a stress on gender as a third point uh, that I think is worth uh, uh, mentioning as a future policy, uh, um, as an item on a future policy agenda. Uh, I think all of us who do work uh, campaigning and lobbying uh, for, uh, for poverty reduction and for improvements in global health. Uh, know by now uh, that uh, looking at interventions through a lens of gender uh, has a magnifying effect. In fact, it's a magnifying lens. Uh, that, if you, that if you get 
um, interventions focused uh, on uh, on women and girls often, uh, whether that's in terms of agricultural interventions or global health or indeed uh, issues like water and sanitation, uh, the impact that you have on poverty reduction uh, is uh, is only uh, extended. And just like Mary and Schengen, uh, extremely interested in the in the comments in the uh, in the analysis uh, in the report on the role of agriculture uh, as a as a source, an existing source, as the report makes clear, uh, but also potentially a growing source uh, of employment, and particularly employment for uh, for young people. Uh, in Africa, I don't think any of us in the in the development business uh, should have any business in sort of being romantic uh, about uh, about peasant subsistence agriculture. I mean, what uh, what we want to uh, advocate for uh, is a situation where smart investment in uh, in uh, in agriculture, in farming, uh, in the in the whole nexus, as Schengen rightly called it, of hunger, nutrition, farming, agriculture, what have you. Uh, creates real opportunities uh, for young people uh, to become little entrepreneurs and to uh, and to really drive economic change. So I think we know what the policy agenda for the next uh, for the next five ten years will be uh, in terms of placing agriculture within the context of what we might do uh, to drive down uh, levels of extreme poverty uh, to a point where we can actually by 2030 or so dream that we're in something like a zero zone. The question is, how do we actually take that accepted policy agenda and, uh, and make it real? And, and that, as always, uh, depends on political will. And it doesn't just depend on political will in the rich countries of the world, it depends on political will in the poor countries of the world, too. Uh, one of the things that we at the One Campaign uh, do every year, and our, our annual uh, uh, edition of it is coming out in the next couple of weeks, uh, is to look at what we call an agriculture accountability report. In other words, to kind of really drill down uh, and look at the extent to which uh, donor countries uh, are meeting the um, uh, L'Aquila uh, commitments. I know L'Aquila has kind of formally run out, but I mean, looking at the extent to which they're continuing uh, to really support uh, agricultural intervention, look at the progress of things like the New Alliance and so on, identify the fact that, as has already been mentioned, we haven't made nearly as much progress uh, in, uh, in finding interventions that tackle either visible malnutrition or, for that matter, invisible malnutrition uh, on the one hand, but also looking at the extent to which African countries in particular uh, have or have not uh, met their Abuja commitments uh, to, uh, to uh, dedicate a specific uh, proportion of their, uh, of their budget uh, to agricultural investment. Accountability for us is key because it's, it's by holding governments accountable, both in the rich world and the poor world, uh, that you can ensure that you can create a, uh, a climate uh, for political change and for political development, uh, without which uh, the very, very sensible, straightforward, and easy to understand uh, policy agenda that I'm delighted to see kind of come so clearly uh, out of the IFPRI annual report won't be driven forward. Uh, so accountability for us is a, is a central element uh, of how we, uh, of how we uh, take uh, this very, very straightforward, sensible, uh, and hopeful policy agenda and, uh, and drive it forward over the next five to ten years. Thank you very much. Thank you.